we discover key insights from the parable of the sower on how to have the Word of God produce in our lives. We learn about the three parts to the biblical process of meditation so that we can sow, germinate and nurture God's Word in our hearts. You know, Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8, uh, very interesting verse because uh, it's, a, you know, it's a tough situation, right? Joshua is in, uh, in a tough position there because his leader has passed away. And he's left with this overwhelming task of leading this whole nation of Israel. Um, and the one to whom he always turned to and received counsel and uh, received uh, uh, instructions, he's not there. And the Lord comes to him and uh, he says uh, this startling, um, you know, the opening statement is this, Joshua chapter 1 and verse 2. Moses my servant is dead. It can't be as plain, plain as that, right? The Lord is saying, Joshua, Moses, my servant is dead. Okay, so that's the end of that. But he goes on to give Joshua some instruction. And in verse 8, this is what he says. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. This book of the law, Joshua, shall not depart from your mouth. Meaning, Make it part of your speaking. The truth that is in this word, make it part of your confession. You declare it. Then he goes on to say, you know, you meditate in it day and night and you, you also be careful to observe, to do everything that's written in it. But he starts by saying, you will make sure that be careful that the book of the law does not depart from your mouth. Let it not stop your declaration. Let your confession be in line with the word. And I believe this morning, this same principle hold good, holds good for all of us, for each of us, right? That we will declare the word of God. The objective is clear. The Lord says, so that you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. So this is one of the things. Confess, declare the word of God. And if you look at Joshua's situation, it was a very overwhelming one. It's not a pleasant one. Saying, oh, I have to lead these people. I've known the complaints of the people. I've known the weight of leadership that Moses carried. It's not an easy task. But the Lord is saying, this is what I want you to do, Joshua, in that situation. Right? So uh, for us, when we face such a situation, I believe the Lord would say the same thing. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth day and night. But you will meditate on it. And you will observe. You will be careful to observe, to do all that is written in it. And you will make your way prosperous. You will make your way successful. And you will have good success. Right. So as we make our declaration this morning, let's, let's this, you know, um, just think about this, that this is an instruction from God himself. This is not a ritual that we do every Sunday, but this is a principle that is laid out in the word. And this is something that God himself wants us to do so that we might have good success. Amen. So why don't we all stand up? If you have your Bibles, you know, just lift it up, hold it up high and let's declare it bold and strong. This is God's word. And this is God speaking to me. I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I am saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I am blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I am a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of His blessing to many people. I receive His word. I believe His word. And I live by his word. Christ is my master. And to him, I am in absolute surrender. I advance boldly to take new ground, to extend God's kingdom. I have kingdom power and authority vested in me. The powers of darkness cannot hold me back or pin me down. The forces of the enemy cannot restrain me or contain me. The greater one is in me. 
God's power through me is more than what the devil can do. Is more than what the devil can handle. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just turn to your neighbor, just shake their hands and tell them, I'm glad that you're here. Right? If you're from the same family, just turn back and shake someone else's hand also. Right? Just declare the word of God. God bless you. God bless you. You are blessed. You are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Amen. Uh, you know, this morning, Pastor uh, Ashish is ministering in, uh, at APC East. He's also staying back to uh, just meet with the team and um, minister there. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, I think last couple of Sundays, we've been studying about uh, the Word of God, right? J- January this month, we, we started saying we, we're going back to basics. We're going to look at the Word of God and something foundational. And we also saw that God's Word uh, works in amazing ways. We, we looked at how God works by His Word. If He wants to do something, He releases His Word. If He wants to create something, He releases His Word. If, if He wants to bring in change, He releases His Word. Right? And, um, and we also studied how we, as believers, we are privileged to do the same thing. We are privileged to receive his word. We are privileged to experience the power of God's word. You know, it's, it's, it's our privilege as followers of the Lord Jesus, as believers in, in his word, to, of course, study the word to have wonderful, you know, discussions and, and, and say, you know, how wonderful this is and how poetic this is and do you see this word that is used, all that is good and intellectually, you know, we can just, uh, we can uh, look at the facts and the figures and, and say, oh, this is so wonderful, you know, see how it's arranged and so on. But more than that, we have the privilege of experiencing the power of the truth that is in God's word. Amen. So which means that we have the privilege of experiencing his word. Not just reading it, not just understanding it, but we have the privilege of experiencing God's word. And uh, this series is about that, that we will, we will not just study, but we will know how to take the word of God, how to receive the word of God, and experience what God says in his word. Uh, and I just pray that, uh, that it will be an experience for all of us. So we saw that God works by his word. We also saw that God's word carries God's power. And um, of course, last Sunday, uh, we just worshipped. We just spent time in worship, right? Um, and uh, how many of you were here last Sunday? Right? Awesome time in God's presence. Apparently, uh, you know, to, uh, yesterday was also 25th year of an outpouring, of an earlier outpouring, 25th anniversary. So Awesome. God's presence is awesome. Um, uh, what he does in our lives is, um, you know, awesome. So praise God for that. Okay, so last Sunday, if you were in any other location, this is what we would have covered, okay? <laughs> I, let me put it that way. So we saw that God's word is like a hammer, it's like a fire. Jeremiah 23 and 29 says, God's word is like a hammer which breaks the rock in pieces, which reduces, a, it could be a huge rock, but it reduces it to a uh, 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 rubble. You know, if, you, uh, if you've been to uh, the airport and if, if you've been in Bangalore for some time and if you've you know, gone on that uh, airport road towards Devanahalli, uh, after the Yelanka, you know, the air, um, the school which is there, uh, the army thing, uh, so the Air Force school, you will see that uh, there's a quarry right on the left. I mean, if you notice that, you've seen that. Um, and I see that it's actually reducing. Right? They've been doing some work. They've been, uh, it's, it's reducing. It's uh, reducing in size. And now you might say, okay, it's bad for the ecosystem and all that. And uh, yeah, uh, but there's a life lesson there. The fact is that any, any you know, you could say, okay, it's a, it's a big, huge rock, but it will be brought to rubble. And there's no huge rock is match enough for the power of God's hammer. God's word is like a hammer. Amen. So sometimes we, the hammer, we wield it. It needs just one swing and one shot as that rock and it shatters into pieces. But sometimes it's multiple swings at that rock. But the fact is that that rock will be reduced to rubble. And the God's word is like that. 
So when we experience the power of God's word in our lives, we can, we can see that. You know, you know, even in our own lives, you know, we can testify to that. The hard places in our own lives, you know, something, some places that, you know, we were so un- unyielding. But God's word, like a hammer, came and, and just brought to rubble those places in our own lives. And so also our challenges and so also some of the things that we face. God's word is like a hammer. And his word is also like a fire that burns. Like the same verse, Jeremiah 20, 29, talks about how God's word is like a fire that burns up. So burns up and refines and so on. Cleans out. Um, and also Ephesians 5, 26 talks about how God's word is like water that refreshes, water that cleanses and water that quenches our thirst. God's word is also like food. Um, the Lord Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So that the believer can be spiritually nourished. God wants the believer, us, the church, to be nourished spiritually. Not to be malnourished, but to have a good appetite for the word of God. And uh, great things happen when believers are strengthened and they're so full of the word of God. So, word of God is food, and word of God is likened to wa- milk and meat and so on. And uh, so many things that the word of God does, word of God sets us free. The Lord Jesus says, you know, you, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And he also says that when he's talking to the Father, he says, thy word is truth. So we know that God's word sets us free. God's word cleans us. That's what we saw just now. God's word heals us. God released his word. He said, I release my word and they, my word will heal them. Heal all their infirmities. God's word renews our mind. When we look at Romans chapter 12, we see that you know, our life is transformed by the renewing of our minds. And when we renew our minds with the truth of God's word. God's word enlighten us, enlightens us. Um, scripture declares that the entrance of your word gives light and it gives understanding to the simple. So there's enlightenment, true enlightenment, if we are searching for, it's from the word of God. Right? Dispels all darkness, dispels all ignorance. It's true enlightenment spiritually coming from the Word of God. So the Word of God enlightens us. The Word of God builds up faith. Romans 10 and verse you know, 17 talks about how faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. So there's something called faith that is produced in us as we have a healthy diet of God's Word. And we as believers need faith to do the things that God has called us to do. right? To carry out the things that he's asked us to do. And the uh, word of God also empowers us. So today we are we're going to look at how do I get this word into my system, you know, into my life. Do I casually hear? Do I read? Do I, you know, what do I need to do in order to get this word in me so that I can experience all the wonderful things that God has said will happen if I, you know, that is there in his word. So what do I need to do as a believer? What should I do? Okay, so we turn to Mark chapter 4. Okay, Mark chapter 4. And Mark chapter 4 is a well-known parable. And I'm sure we have learned this in Sunday school. We have learned this in, you know, junior church, children's church. You know, depends on which denomination you come from. You know, it's called Sunday school in some junior church. When I grew up, I, I went to Sunday school, I went to junior church, and I came to children's church also. <laughs> Done the, you know, the journey. So Mark chapter 4, we're talking about the parable of the sower. Okay, so if you have your op- Bibles, can you just open up to Mark chapter 4? Let's read through and um, very quickly. Verse, verse 2 talks about how he taught many things by parables and said to them in his teaching... Okay, so he's talking and he's teaching the parable. Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And it happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside. And the birds of the air came and devoured it. Some fell on stony ground where it did not have much earth. And immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched. And because it had no root, it withered away. And some seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. But other seed fell on good ground and yielded a crop that sprang up, increased, 
and produced some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100. So the Lord is painting this picture about the sower going out to sow and different kinds of soil, different kinds of ground, and the outcome of the seed being in different kinds of soil. Right? And he's explaining in verse 13, if we go down, uh, he's talking to his disciples and he's saying, do you not understand this parable? Because they ask him, you know, explain to us. Um, how then will you understand all the parables? Verse 14, the sower sows the word. And these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground. So he's moving to the other kind of soil, stony ground. Who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness. And they have no root in themselves and so endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises, for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. Now, these are the ones sown among thorns. These are the ones who hear the word. And the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things entering in choke the word. And it becomes unfruitful. But these are the ones sown on good ground. Those who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit. Some 30-fold, some 60, and some a 100-fold. So when we look at this, uh, we see parallel portions of this, uh, this very parable in, in Matthew chapter 18. Sorry, Matthew chapter 13, and also in Luke chapter 8. And so very briefly, let's just look at Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13 and verse, verse 18. Uh, says, therefore hear the parable of the sower, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received seed by the wayside. He who received the seed on the stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives with joy and so on. And uh, if you turn to Luke chapter 8, we see the same thing explained there, Luke 8 and verse 11. Um, and if you, you know, when we go to uh, yeah, verse 11 and uh, verse 15 actually talks about the ones that fall on good ground and those who having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. So certain things that we see here happening in operation that that, that's happening. There's a sower, he's sowing the word, sowing the seed. Now the seed is likened to the word of God. So the sower is actually sowing the seed and the seed is the word of God. And uh, it's sowed on different kinds of, it's sown on different kinds of grounds, like different kinds of soils and different outcomes are happening here. Um, but the thing is the seed. And when you look at the seed, you know, you see, you know, I liked the way one explained it. He said, in the seed is the tree. In the seed is the tree. You see a mango seed, you pick it up. The tree is actually in the seed. It has great potential. It has intrinsic power. In the right place, in the right environment, and when it's protected and nurtured, it produces what it has in it. Now, the word of God is seed. That the sower sows. It's sown. But immediately what happens when we don't understand the word that is sown in our hearts, what happens? Satan comes and takes it away. Satan comes immediately and takes it away. And when I read that verse, I just see that Satan is so interested in the word. Right? When we don't engage, when we don't understand it, Satan comes immediately. Comes immediately. So, I sometimes think, you know, Satan knows the potential of God's word more than the believer. More than the sons and daughters of God. Satan knows the potential. If this word, if this truth is sown in the sons and daughters of God, if they nurture it, if they develop it, it's going to bear fruit. Because the word of God has power. It's going to change their lives. They're going to be spiritual giants. They're going to walk with authority. They're going to increase in faith. And they're going to do great things. They're going to extend the kingdom. They're going to come against the gates of hell. 
So Satan comes immediately and takes away the word. Then we see different kinds of soil. We see that our heart is like that ground. It is by the wayside. There's a kind of ground. There's a stony ground. And, um, and each kind of soil has a different response. right? And uh, so the condition of our heart is important as well. The condition of our heart. Is it stony? Is it hard? Is it good ground? The third thing we see is that the seed must be protected and nurtured. There's nothing wrong with the seed. But the seed must be protected because Satan is going to come to take away that seed. To take away that revelation. To take away that understanding. Right? And every time we maybe... You know, we enter into, give into temptation and we live in a, probably a lifestyle of sin. You know, as believers, right? What happens is that revelation that was there in our heart, you know, Satan just, it just, we actually give it up. That revelation about certain truths, maybe about righteousness, maybe about justice, maybe about, you know, about God's nature, about God's grace. That revelation, you know, we just give it up. And so, we must do our part to really protect and nature, protect and nurture. It will produce. Then uh, we must understand the word, comprehend it. We will face tribulation, persecution, and temptation because of the word that we receive. That is something that we see. That there is tribulation. It says persecution, tribulation because of the word. Now, why did it come to remove that word? So it seems like everything is just, you know, targeted on the word of God. I need to make sure that this word does not work in the believer's life. It seems like that. It seems like there's an agenda there coming against the believer to just take the word out. Right? So we see that. We put tribulation, pressure, troubles, persecution, and temptation. So our response to that, first of all, we understand the word. We make sure that we, you know, we, we kind of engage with the word. The second thing is to hold on to the word. To hold fast to the word. To have the understanding that, yes, you know, there are some things that are coming. There's some pressure. There's some temptation. But I'm not going to let go of the word. I'm going to hold fast to the word. And in this environment, in this soil you know, of my heart... It is going to bear fruit. So I'm not going to let go of the word. So we are called to hold on. Have a good grip on the word of God. Strong grip on the word of God. On the revelation that you have in your heart. Just don't just let go. Just hold on and say, I'm not, I'm not, going, to let it, I'm not going to let go. I'm going to hold on in faith. I know it will bear fruit. Uh, in uh, Mark chapter 4, towards the last part, we see that cares of the world, deceitfulness of riches, and lust for other things come and choke the word of God. Okay? Cares of the world. Uh, when we look at cares of the world, we know that you know, in Matthew chapter 5, the Lord is talking about, you know, don't worry about certain things, you know, about food, about clothing, about shelter. He's saying, don't worry about these things. Right? And you see that list. You see, these are legitimate needs. Yes or no? Yeah, these are legitimate needs. But there's a line that we cross when we, when we care, when we worry about it, rather than planning or working for it. You know, we, we cross a line when we just constantly worry about it. So this worry, this care, actually chokes the word of God. It comes against and, and chokes the word of God, makes it unfruitful. In fact, in one of the verses it says, and he becomes unfruitful. Referring to the person who's carrying the word. He becomes unfruitful. Right? So, if we meditate on the word, if we hold on to the word, we actually close our door on these cares. We close our door on Satan. We close, we open the door for the work of the Holy Spirit to really strengthen us, to give us even more revelation. So, the cares of the world, deceitfulness of riches. What is deceitfulness of riches? We know that um, we need money to survive. Anybody is of a differing opinion? 
you know, we work, we, we do everything, you know, we need money to survive. That's the currency of this world that we live in and we need that, right? But the deceitfulness of riches is like this, you know, and Paul writes to Timothy and he says, you know, um, he says, Timothy, just tell the people who are rich in this world, you know, not to trust in uncertain riches, but to trust in the Lord who gives us richly to enjoy so that's the thing. You know, it's, it's kind of misplaced trust. You know, it's the Lord who's giving them. It's the Lord who richly gives. You know, he's a generous God. But Paul is saying, you know, Timothy, let those who are wealthy not put their trust in these uncertain riches. So there's a certain level of security and comfort that riches can give us. Right? A bank balance. You know, uh, every time, I, I don't know if you do it, but when I move out of the house, I just check if my wallet is there. You know, just pat... Just make sure it's there. You know, you're carrying all your cards and you know, license and everything. But you just, you know, there's a kind of assurance. Okay, we're going to this hotel. Okay, there's a card. There's a wallet there. Okay. But the deceitfulness of it is that if I'm going to trust in that alone, it's God who gives us. But if I misplace that trust, that's deceitfulness of riches. And what happens is it comes against the word of God sown in our hearts. Instead of the word being fruitful, it chokes the word. And we become unfruitful. And what, the very things that God wants us to enjoy and experience through his word, we are unable to do that. So, deceitful riches and lust for other things. It could be position, it could be power, it could be wrong priorities, wrong choices. So, Matthew 13, 22, that's the verse which says, he becomes unfruitful. The person becomes unfruitful. So there's nothing wrong with the word of God. The word of God is powerful. When he speaks, he creates. When he speaks, he transforms. But we become unfruitful because these things choke. So we have a responsibility. Okay. Can you turn to your neighbor and say, you have a responsibility. Okay. Somebody just woke up. <laughs> responsibility. Responsibility is a good word, right? It's a good word. We have a responsibility. And in this whole thing of receiving the word, we have a responsibility to understand the word. We have a responsibility to receive the word. We have a responsibility to make sure that the word is protected and nurtured. We have a responsibility, right? Okay, so let's look at um, what the word does. You know, in your botany class, probably you've studied about the different stages of germination. I've forgotten it completely, but I have this picture of that, uh, you know, that seed. It's like a double bean, and then just comes up, sprout, and then everything. And, uh, you know, I, I know that. So, uh, so it's not instant, right? When a seed is sown, it's not instant. I remember, you know, uh, my brother and I, I think, I don't know why uh, my mother, uh, our mother, you know, did this, but probably to get us interested in gardening and all that. I think we used to read that comic book, Tinkle, and it has these different projects, right? So, um, so one of that was gardening, and then she, you know, there was a small trough, and she planted two onions and said, "Okay, one for you, one for you know, uh, the thing." And okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to see it grow. We're going to sprout out, right? So we kept that. Yes, it was done. The next day, my brother and wife properly went, dug it up, you know, took it and see, okay, how how much has it grown? <laughs> And, uh, and then we, you know, we again put it back. And the next day we did the same thing. We came and, you know, how much has it grown in 24 hours, you know? I think we were the original fast food junkies, you know, we started there. <laughs> um, but really, nothing happened to that seed. Nothing happened, you know, nothing sprouted. Because we had to give it time. Because there is that seed, time, and harvest. We need to give that time. So, um, so same thing ha uh, happens when we, uh, the whole, uh, whole thing of time, you know, maybe the seed is sown in our hearts and we are impatient. God, where, what is it? You know, nothing is sprouting, nothing is happening. It all seems quiet, Lord. Uh, do I dig it up? Do I look at it, you know, closely? What is happening? No, 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 just give it time. The, the God's word has power. God's word has intrinsic power and, and you just keep it in that environment of faith and watered by the Holy Spirit and, and hold on to it. 
and uh, protect that word protect that revelation protect that prophecy that promise you know that thing that he has said will happen will in your life and and you know it's been confirmed by two or three witnesses and you know it beyond a shadow there's a conviction there in your heart yes this is this will work this is what god has said our responsibility is to give it that time it's happening god is moving uh circumstances god is putting things certain things in place and um, he's organizing things he's setting up divine appointments and what he said will happen so the process of germination the word, the seed will produce and sometimes we don't know how it will happen right i uh maybe if you're a if you're a researcher if you're a scientist you know the whole process what happens inside a seed but the you know the farmer does not know he knows that at this time it will happen all he has to do is make sure that the insects don't come make sure that the rodents don't dig it up make sure it's protected make sure it's watered and it's uh, make sure that happens and he knows that you know the seed will produce that's all he knows and so that reminds us of something you know we don't have to get into the nuts and bolts and mechanics if you want to that's fine but god's word will produce the seed will produce so we have a part to play in this to protect to nurture but also when the harvest comes we have a part in it as well um uh, if you look at mark chapter 4 again verse 26 to 29 so after explaining the parable um mark chapter 426 and he said the kingdom of god is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground and should sleep by night and rise by day and the seed should sprout and grow he himself does not know how for the earth yields crops by itself first the blade then the head after that the full grain in the head but when the grain ripens immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come so we have a part in gathering the harvest we uh, we we'll, we we'll look at it probably later you know how do i do that but we have a part in that as well right so how do i make sure sure that the word is sown the word i give it time to germinate and etc we find the key for that in joshua chapter 1 and verse 8 where the lord says this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth but you shall meditate okay can everyone say meditate okay meditate in it day and night so we know that it's different from uh when we actually read when we see different scripture we see that it's different from uh you know the worldly meditation no there's a lot of talk about meditation there's a lot of articles on meditation there's a lot of people who are meditating but the biblical meditation is different right and we'll we'll see how different it is psalm 1 also talks about meditating in the word psalm 1 verses 1 to 3 talks about the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly or stands in the path of sinners does not sit in the seat of the scornful but his delight is in the law of the lord on which he meditates day and night so it's not an alien concept this whole thing of meditation so there is this whole thing of biblical meditation that we as believers are called to you know called to intentionally step into do with the word okay so scriptural meditation there are two words in the hebrew which talk about this two words um the first one is a word called haga okay can everyone say that together haga okay it means to reflect imagine ponder mutter to contemplate to repeat the words okay so i need to ask myself you know am i doing that when i in my quiet time you know when i read and when i close the bible is that the end of it right and uh, i go back to it only when i open it next no here he's saying this is what we do we think we reflect imagine uh mutter say to ourselves you know this is what god says this is what god says this is what he will do for me uh, yes i am i will be led in a triumphant procession in christ jesus 
Uh, this is what he says, God, you will lead me in a triumphant procession in Christ Jesus. What, about, what does a triumphant procession look like in my situation? This is Haga. You know, we are revisiting, we are muttering, we are just you know, speaking it over and over again. Uh, another word is siak, which carries the same kind of meaning to pray, to declare, to ponder, to, to read aloud and so on. So we are called to meditate on the word of God, not just read. And, uh, and, and leave it at that, to meditate on the word of God. Okay. Um, just want to read this section, which is there in the Spirit Life Bible, and it talks about this word haga. Haga represents something quite unlike the English meditation, which may be a mental exercise only. In Hebrew thought, to meditate upon the scriptures is to quietly repeat them in a soft, droning sound while utterly abandoning outside distractions. Okay, let me just read that again. So maybe, uh, it means to meditate upon scriptures is to quietly repeat them in a soft and droning sound, while utterly abandoning outside distractions. From this tradition comes a specialized type of Jewish prayer called davening. That is, reciting texts, praying, intense prayers, or getting lost in communion with God, while bowing or rocking back and forth, evidently this dynamic form of meditation prayer goes back to David's time. So you see how different it is. It's not just a mental gymnastics thing, but it involves our entire being, spirit, soul, and body, and we are intensely engaging with the word of God. So when we meditate on the word and we just you know, receive the word, there's no way that the enemy can come and pluck that word out. We'll be strong to face the temptation. We'll be strong to face the tribulations as well. Because we have made space in our lives. We've made time in our lives to meditate on the word of God. Three more things about meditation. Three words actually, uh, and uh, which we saw here is contemplation, visualization, and confession. Contemplation. Psalm 143 and verse 5, the psalmist says, I remember the days of old. I meditate on all your works. I muse on the work of your hands. So to contemplate, to think within ourselves. What did the Lord do? Oh, in the early days, this is what you did, oh God. You know, to make a note of it, to think about it, to go back to it. And many times the Lord directs us to those moments, to those times when he came through, when he was with us. When he led us to go back to those times, to go back to those moments. Oh God, you were, yes, you were there. Yes, there was a lot of confusion. Yes, there was a lot of pain. But you were there, Lord, in the midst of all that. And you took us through. You took me through that, Lord. You brought me out into the light again to contemplate, to think deeply about. Second one is visualization. Something that the Lord did to Abraham. He, he, in Genesis 15, we see this. He, uh, he, God calls Abraham and then uh, he was known as Abram then. He calls him out and he says, look at the heavens. And he looks up, look at the stars, can you count them? And Abram says, probably he tried, probably he failed. The Lord says, so many will be your descendants, Abram. He paints a picture to Abram. And that, that visual, I'm sure, must be very, very deeply ingrained in his, in his mind. Every time he, th he has doubts, every time he has questions, that picture. Oh yes, I see the stars. This is what God told me. I believe it. I'm hoping against hope. I'm hoping against hope. And I'm giving glory to God. And I will receive what he has promised. So a visualization, a mental picture of what God can do of what God will do in our lives. And the third thing, of course, is confession. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, This book of law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate, you shall confess, you shall declare it. And declaration does not happen, you know, the, the need to declare or the invitation to declare the word of God does not happen when everything is fine, when the environment is fine. And praise God when it's like that. But often, it's the opposite of what the word says, right? It's, it's a difficult circumstance. It's a difficult situation. And that's when, you know, we need to really lean in to God and declare and confess. I say, this is what God says. 
So it's not the ideal thing and it's not like worship music playing in the background and we are sitting there with a cup of coffee and we open the word and say, ah, yes. And that's great, right? When it happens, it's fantastic. But in the heat of the battle, when things are flying about, when there's so much, you know, we just quiet and come to that place, come under his, yeah, come under his hand, under the shadow, we find refuge and we say, God, this is how I fight my battle, God. I take your word, I take your song, and I, I just declare it. I declare it, confess the word of God. So this is what we do as believers, right? When the germination happens, this is how we protect. This is how we, we nurture the environment of our heart. We meditate, we contemplate, we visualize, we confess. And Deuteronomy 30 verse 14 says, The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That you may do it. Right? So as believers, you know, maybe from tomorrow when we have your quiet time, when we read the word of God, let it not be just a case of reading and forgetting or reading and closing. And, but let's make space in our lives. Let's make space in our hearts, in our minds for the word of God to dwell richly. Let intensely, let's engage with the word of God. Engage with the word of God. And uh, let us be a, you know, a body of believers who will experience the 30, 60, and the 100 fold. Amen. Amen. So, um, but that happens when we you know, value the word of God. All this, uh, it happens when we value the word of God. right? When we esteem the word of God. It's so important. Um, because if we do not value the word, um, then we will not really engage in it. I'm sure you've, had, you've asked directions from people and uh, something about them you didn't trust. <laughs> right? You asked directions and then you said, go this way. And then, uh, you know, you quietly, you just turn this way. I think, I just feel this is the, yes, I don't think you were sure. You didn't value that instruction, right? We didn't value it. Something, we didn't doubt it then. But when we value God, when we value the word of God, Paul writes and he says, you know, when you received the word from us, you didn't receive it as, as it being from men, but you, you know, as it is in truth, the word of God, that's how you received it. So when we value God and we value his word, we will actually put this in practice. We will say, okay, this is something precious. I need to do something with it. I can't just let go. You know, this is God speaking. This is God giving instructions. This is God saying, okay, this is how you fight. This is how you, you know, get your breakthroughs. And this is how you will make your way prosperous. So I better take it seriously. I just want to read a poem. It's really blessed me. And um, this is by Dr. Chris Nyanakan, um, you know, who was here in Syax. He's preached here a couple of times also, uh, Dr. Chris Nyanakan. So it's called My Precious Old Book. So here it goes. Though the cover be torn and its pages be worn and places bear traces of tears, yet more precious than gold is this book worn and old that can shatter and scatter my fears. As I prayerfully look in this precious old book, many treasures and pleasures I see, many promises of love from my Father above who is nearest and dearest to me. This book is a guide, is a friend by my side. It will lighten and brighten my day. And each promise I find soothes and gladdens my mind as I preach it and teach it each day. To this book I will cling. Of its worth I will sing. Though many crosses and losses be mine, for I cannot despair those surrounded by care while possessing this blessing divine. My precious old book, Dr. Chris Nyanakan. You know, if we would esteem the word of God, if we would not use the Bible as a good luck charm or to chase Dracula away, you know, or use it under a pillow you know, for exams and exam times, and we've done all that, you know, if we would treat it for what it truly is, that it's the word of God, it should sharper than any two-edged sword, cutting to the soul and spirit, knows the judges, the intents of our heart and the motives of our, of our heart. 
if we would receive it and engage in it. Uh, we be a body of believers, uh, truly people of the word, walking in the light of God's word and experiencing his truth. Amen. Why don't we all stand and pray. Um, just want to encourage us, you know, uh, maybe if you don't have a Bible and, you know, if, if you're not in the habit of carrying your Bible, just want to encourage us to carry it, to, um, to read it, to, to, to deeply engage, intensely engage with the Word, um, with the Word of God. And this morning as we pray, um, you know, let's, let's tell the Lord, Lord, I, I esteem your Word. I value your Word for what it is. Um, I'm sorry for the times that I've, you know, taken it for granted or, you know, put it aside or treated it lightly and uh, not given it the importance I should have, Lord. But today, this morning, even as we've studied, even as we've seen what all the Word can do, all that the Word can accomplish in my life, and knowing, God, that it comes from you, the Father of lights, the one who loves me more than anyone else. The one who instructs me with his eye, eyes. Or the one who tells me where to go, where to stop. You know, we can just tell the Lord, Lord, you love us so much. You care for us so much. You gave yourself on the cross for us. So that we might be with you. So that we might live a life, a fruitful life on this earth. So that we might dispel your glory. That people will see your good works and be drawn to you. Lord, it is you who's saying that we need to hold on. That we need to nurture, we need to protect. And so God, we, we choose this day. We choose this day to make space, to give the rightful place of your word in our lives. And also pray saying, Lord, we, we give you the rightful place in our lives. Be enthroned in our hearts. Our priorities, our desires, our dreams and everything, God. Let, let it flow, flow from that place of you reigning in our hearts. You taking that first place in our lives, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, Master. Yes, Father God, we, we just want to thank you. We just want to thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace, your mercy. You invite us time and again to your very best, to your throne room, God, to obtain grace and mercy. Thank you for the way that you made for each one of us to come boldly. And today we do so, Lord. And today we choose, Lord, to read, meditate, confess, contemplate, visualize, God, declare your word, Father God even as we journey with you. Speak to us, Lord. Let your rhema, God, be quickened in our hearts, even as we feed, Lord, on your word, God. Hallelujah. We thank you. We give you all the praise. and We give you all the glory. In Jesus' matchless name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you a shalom. Amen. Amen. God bless. Have a great week and have a great Sunday as well. And continue to you know, read the word of God and meditate on the word of God. Amen. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also visit our website apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.